Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to the Operational Intelligence Market Overview at InsideAnalysis.com. My name is Eric Cavanaugh with the Bloor Group. I will be your host for today's session in which we're going to learn from Brad Hopper. He is from the office of the CTO at TIBCO. Uh, so with that, Brad, show us what you guys have. Great, Eric. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, some of your listeners may know that um, TIBCO is a provider of uh, a variety of different infrastructure and real-time event-driven tools. And I'm going to kind of feature two specific categories of tools here and then focus on how they fit together in order to deliver a what we call operations analytics kind of solution. So you can see here on the screen I've got a you know big blue bubble for analytics and a green bubble for events. So the Spotfire analytics technology is a, a, a leader in the interactive visual analytics of data, driving insight for business professionals in a variety of different industries and so on. And then our business events product is a CEP engine, which is a real-time event-driven architecture that, again, is applied for uh, in a lot of different industries in a kind of a real-time sense. And the idea here is to explain and then give a demonstration of how these pieces can fit together to deliver operations analytics. So the, 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 the initial concept is quite simple. Um, it, since we have such a terrific environment for interacting with data and, and finding insights and uncovering trends and relationships, why not use that technology in order to identify those trends and establish rules uh, according to those trends and maybe thresholds or even statistical models and, and other capabilities I'll talk about in a, in a few moments. Why not use analytics to define what those rules should be, translate them into the events engine, so that they can be executed and optimized or scored, if you will, in real time. And then also on the reverse side, if you detect an unusual circumstance in the eventing engine, say in your factory or in your, um, in your point of sale data or what, what have you, then why not, in addition to the automated action that you might take with a CEP engine, why not drive into the root cause analysis and back into the human sphere again and deliver the right contextual data so that the business professional can do some root cause analysis or um, strategic investigation into what's going on. So that's fundamentally the concept here. Now we can kind of blow that up into more of a life cycle picture here and, and I'll, I'm gonna, this is kind of a setup for the demonstration workflow that I'm gonna show you. So we start out with this idea that an application should be fit to a business process. So I'm going to show you an application, in this case specific to manufacturing, that might be designed to help a manufacturing engineer troubleshoot a problem on the, on the factory floor. So if you're going to monitor a real-time system, the first job is really to understand the baseline. If you don't know what normal means, it's going to be impossible to detect an abnormal situation. So for this, of course, we can use that visual analytics technology that I described, perhaps supplemented by modeling, data mining technologies, and so on. But we want to figure out what normal means. And then uh, detect that um, set of trends or, or postulate a set of trends or correlations or relationships that we want to then translate into rules. And I use that word rules loosely because it could be rules uh, explicitly, or it could be a, a multivariate predictive model or a, you know, a data mining algorithm that responds you know, when it detects thresholds or probabilities above a certain level. We put those rules online. And then finally, as I said before, we cycle back into a decision-making kind of framework. And of course, um, if you find assignable cause and fix it, you're good to go. You just keep on with your monitoring system. On the other hand, if the process itself has changed uh, because you've, you've made a process change or because the market has changed in some way, you want to be able to continuously adapt those rules on an ongoing basis so that you can, in the end, continuously improve that process. So that's the setup. I'm going to give you uh, one of two demonstrations that I typically share. I'm going to show you the first one here, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the second one, even though I'm not going to show it to you. So the idea here is that we're a manufacturer, and our objective is to deploy some very simple, what we call process capability rules, in order to monitor, in our case, 55 distinct uh, real-time variables coming from a process. So here, what we've done is implement on this operations analytics platform some traditional statistical process control rules. And so that, you know, typically encompasses a threshold that you calculate statistically from the data, 
And if a data point goes, goes completely outside of those thresholds, then obviously somebody needs to know about it. Also, there's kind of a series of cascading rules, like two out of three out of two sigma, and so on through the um, Western Electric kind of uh, historical rule set. So this is just an example, an illustration of how you can use a rule platform and an analytics tool together in order to do this real-time operations analytics. Now, the second demonstration that I'm not going to show you today uh, from time constraints, but it's, it's pretty interesting too, is instead of those simple traditional kind of process-oriented rules, we, were, we can use um, data mining techniques such as a decision tree. And that example, we are identifying populations of people in a retail banking scenario who might be good candidates to accept, say, an upsell offer. And so then in real time, as people come to your website or as they make transactions with your bank, they move into different um, uh, dynamic segmentation areas. And then immediately upon you know, swiping that ATM card the last time that month, you become eligible or a good candidate for that offer, and it gets made right there at the ATM or on the website and so on and so forth. So I want to you know, stress that the example I'm showing you is just illustrative um, with uh, some example rules, but, the, but that the workflow and that kind of closed loop scenario is the key element that TIPCO is innovating in in this space today. So with that, let me jump over to the, the demonstration. I've got a, a virtual machine running here that's got all of the tools necessary uh, to hook to hook the system up. And after the demonstration, I'll go back and show you the architecture for you know 30 seconds, just so the uh, IT oriented folks in the crowd will will understand how those pieces fit together. So. What I'm starting out with here is pretty, pretty bland looking. This is actually just a little utility that we put together for generating real-time data so that we can then go respond to it. So I'm going to start in the middle of that process life cycle. I'm going to start with the real-time monitoring. And then we'll go through detection of the event. And then we'll come back to defining the rules, which you know ostensibly is the beginning of the process, but it's a little bit more convenient to kind of start with the real-time and then end with the, end with the analytics. So I have a file here just you know, sitting on my desktop that has 8,000 transactions or measurements coming out of my process equipment or um, characteristics coming out of my supply chain or transport network. It really doesn't matter. It's real-time data uh, or it's, it's, it's a series of transactions, and I'm going to play it back in real time to simulate that factory running or that transportation network running. So I'm going to generate 5,000 different transactions at a rate of you know, 50 per second or so, and I'll go ahead and just start those spinning, right? So just you know, for the, the doubting Thomases in the audience, just I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the command line, but you can see something is happening here indeed for real in the background. This is our event engine doing its, doing its thing. And what I'm going to do is switch over to my email system. And in my email system, I can show you the result of having detected an event. So here at the top of the list, I have previously run this scenario, and let's, let's click through a few here. So here's one, um, a two sigma rule violation. Uh, let's find one that's sort of more interesting to look at and more obvious in terms of, there we go. So here's a three sigma rule violation. Again, this is just an example kind of rule, and I, I picked these because they're kind of obvious to see what's happening. So I have a message from the system that was generated automatically. It tells me that this particular rule was violated on this particular measurement parameter, pressure, temperature, flow rates, um, you know, cycle times for the factory, or arrival times, or delta arrival times, any kind of derived variables, really doesn't matter. But this variable had an issue on this particular, let's say, batch. And then I have some more kind of speeds and feeds. You know, what was the value itself? What was the timestamp where this was detected? And then here, kind of importantly, I have a visual indication of what the system found. And in this case, it's kind of obvious, right? I have a, a red dot that's completely outside of the boundaries that are depicted by these orange lines here on my trend. And then importantly, I have a link that will drive me to an application that can help me do root cause analysis. So it's going to help me, you know, triage the situation and then in addition, in addition to that, solve the problem. So now, while we've been talking, the system has been running, and I can go ahead and synchronize my email, and you can see I'm getting new emails coming in as we speak. So each of these is now a newly detected event from that real-time monitoring that I've just kicked off or that we just kicked off together here a few moments ago. So I could click this link and launch into the application, you know, like those uh, 
fancy cooking shows on TV. I've already got one of these applications up and running just to save a couple of minutes of our broadcast time here. Um, this is the kind of application that gets created automatically in response to that real-time detection of events. So this is now Spotfire. And what do we have? I have uh, some textual information here, some annotation of the event that was detected. All the you know, speeds and feeds here, the, the type of rule, the, the indicator itself, um, you know, some tracking and, and uh, audit trail on the, the rule breach itself, when did it occur, and so on and so forth. Now, I have a few different data elements in this application that I'll kind of run through here. This first table, you know, entitled, in this case, the limits and metrics, this is really metadata about the data itself. What do I mean by that? For every raw variable in the data set, all of these so-called indicators, in this case, 1 through 55, um, for every raw data, I have a definition of the kind of rule that was defined. And again, this is just an example type of rule. And then I have some key figures of merit. So this CPK is also known as process capability. Basically, this is a single number that tells you how well-centered your data is within your process boundaries, and also how broadly or narrowly distributed it is. Is it tightly clustered right in the center and running, running just fine, or is it kind of spread out and slopping over the sides of your limits? So the higher the number, the better. And you can see, you know, you kind of you want a 1.3 type number like this one, but here we have a 0.58. So indicator number seven jumped out of bed with a three sigma rule. And now notice that the application arrives with this indicator already selected for me. And by virtue of the selection, I have two other visualizations, a histogram and a run chart that are illustrating that exact variable. So if I click on a different um, set of metadata, you can see a different trend, right? So the, the application not only has been generated with the right content automatically, but it's also giving me contextual related other metrics of interest so that I can in traditional Spotfire style, visualize and interact with them, slice and dice the data in a you know visual analytics kind of way. Um, but also, it's um, identified the particular variable. And now you can notice over here in this third table, I'm tracking all of the previous and future violations of this particular metric. And so I say future, in, I'm meaning that in a couple of different ways. One is, you know, the event is detected, so this was the event that was detected that fired the rule. But actually, between that exact microsecond and when the application was fulfilled with all of its data, a few other errors actually occurred. And those are actually present here in the log. And I can see there's another three sigma violation um, in, the, in that, and then I can go all the way back here to this one. So now, I, as, an, as an engineer, I can interact with this data. And from here, I can explore and, and find correlations amongst these different parameters. But importantly, we've taken another step. And that is to say, we know already that when we have an issue with, let's say, pressure and temperature um, on a particular process, whenever we do a root cause analysis, we typically will also get equipment maintenance data, operator data, recipe data, environmental information. All of that contextual, perhaps historical data that is um, related to the real-time information, the system can automatically gather that all up and then immediately apply, again, some statistical analysis, if need be, in order to find correlations between the detected violation and the contextual information that might have caused it. So here we can flip through, this is a, a simple statistic, so-called ANOVA, or analysis of variance. And you know, for each of these metrics, I can flip through and say, OK, um, let me find one that looks kind of interesting. What about indicator 15 here? All right, let's pick this one, right? So this metric, so I might pick indicator number seven you know, to be uh, you know, consistent, but let's just pick this one. It's at the top of the list, because it's actually a stronger signal in the correlation than is indicator seven, which itself perhaps is important information. But anyway, indicator 15 here, um, the correlation has told me that when I see variation in this metric, it is most strongly associated with the equipment that's used in the perforation step. 
So down here, I have a graphical representation of that perforator number one, if you will, has quite a bit of variation in the, the, the y-axis um, compared to perforator tool number two, three, and then other tools that for whatever reason were missing their, you know, their labels. So I can see right here as an engineer that this might be my first course of action is perhaps, you know, mark this tool set and drill further down into, um, you know, details of the maintenance history or what have you of that particular piece of equipment. So the monitored data in this case may be some kind of quality metric of my finished product, but the correlation data may be equipment equipment history or you know, process history or so on and so forth, as I said before. So now the last piece of the puzzle, what we've seen so far is continuous monitoring, detection against a, a particular rule set, and then a root cause and triage kind of analysis of that data after the fact. Now let's close the loop and go back to that kind of initial rule definition problem. So if I go back to, let's pick out another metric, maybe one that looks a little better. Um, if I can't find one, I'll just make one. We'll see. Now, this one looks pretty good. So let's say that I'm, you know, an engineer or business professional responsible for this process. And I can, you know, I, I typically will be responsible for looking at that data on a periodic basis to establish the health of my process. And I need to be um, looking for those issues. And I also need to be hard on myself, right? I can't give myself too much credit and have limits that are too wide. Then I might miss important variation. So this example, uh, for example, I might say, you know what? I have an assignable cause to this variation. And back at this time frame, we put in place a new process that we expected to run more consistently. So. I'm going to go ahead and exclude the previous data and include all of this and exclude this, which might have been, you know, some kind of glitch that I've already established the root cause for. I'm going to just go ahead and filter down to this subset of data and now say, I want to tighten up my process window. So I can go ahead and do that. Let's create a new limit. This one is indicator six, and you can see it's already been selected because that's the variable that I've highlighted here. And I have the opportunity to define which kind of limit that I want to use. I'll just use this mean plus or minus three sigma in this example case. And when I make that calculation, the system is going to, you know, as, as you know, maybe is obvious, calculate the mean of that subset of data, add plus or minus three sigma, and then give me a trend line and a histogram and then my metadata about the targets. All this data is centered around zero. Um, it's been dis it's real data, but it's been disguised and uh, normalized to protect the innocent. Uh, so now I have this new tighter set of limits. If I filter all my data back in, you can see indeed that you know would have caught some of these other metrics. Uh, but but now going forward, I want to use this one. So as a final step, I'll go ahead and publish those limits and communicate with the event engine. And so there we're done. So you could imagine that this final step that we're doing, one might do at the beginning of a new process. I have perhaps 55 or 100 or some of our customers have literally thousands of analytical metrics or methods, um, attributes of their process. And you can use these tools to statistically understand where are the outliers, what's the distribution, let me establish a, you know, a simple process control regime or perhaps a multivariate process control regime using principal components or partial least squares or any kind of, uh, you know, crazy statistical method that you'd like to apply. Regardless of that, we can establish that baseline and then publish it out to the event engine. And now the event engine instantly is monitoring that information, testing the rules, and when I get that violation, notifies exactly the right person in exactly the right moment and provides them the context that they need to triage and get to the root issue uh, that's causing that violation. So that's the closed loop scenario that I wanted to demonstrate um, for your audience. Now, just to kind of finish up here, um, we have a, a transport. So there, obviously, I've been saying real time over and over again, we have technology that can connect to any kind of real time stream that you could imagine anything from equipment data, SCADA data, TCP IP, you know, logs coming off of uh, websites, et cetera, et cetera, telecommunications, 
you know, information, no matter what you got, we can connect to it. So now it may be also required, uh, well, we can adapt to that information using our integration platform and then transport it across the multiple tools using the TIBCO bus. We have an eventing engine, as I described. Built into that eventing engine is a distributed in-memory cache. That means that we can keep a virtual representation of all of those rules continuously ticking over, and every microsecond, you know, when a new transaction comes in, the rules will all be tested and evaluated against um, our care about it. Um, now then, that eventing engine and integration platform can also connect to the historical context, as I've said. You don't want, all of your data isn't real time, but you want to combine that information in an intelligent way to provide context to the real time streams. We have a visual analytics technology called uh, Tipco Spotfire. The visual analytics technology can connect both to the grid directly, so the real time data that's streaming in there, I can extract a snapshot, and I can merge that in an offline basis with the contextual history data, define my rules by round tripping to the statistics engine, and then finally put all those pieces together and we call this operations analytics. And that has been deployed in a number of different industries for monitoring manufacturing information, doing upsell cross-sell, doing fraud detection, doing attrition retention, all of those high value use cases that require correlating real-time data to historical data. I think that's it for the demo. Wow, that's, that's great stuff. I have a couple quick questions. Um, one, so you mentioned runtime for R. What are some of the limitations of R? Because we've talked to a variety of different folks who are working with it, and there are some significant limitations in terms of its, its processing speed, I suppose. But what do you guys see as, as some of the limitations of R? Oh, well, I will speak to the limitations, but let me first say that R, you know, is the most widely used statistical scripting language in the world because sure. it's open source and it's just jam-packed with um, incredibly um, simple and powerful analytics, but also complex and arcane, um, you know, data scientist rules that, you know, can apply to a variety of situations. Now, the challenge that, that companies have with R uh, its strength is its challenge, right? It's open source, which means that it can be very difficult for business organizations to keep track of those changes and validate that they're going to get the same results every time and that everybody in the organization is using the same versions and so on and so forth. Um, the other challenge is that being open source, there's really no support for this technology. There are some services organizations that will um, attempt to help you with the, the, the runtime I mean, with, with R, um, but that's kind of a you know haphazard. There's no owner, no um, throat to choke, as they say. Uh, so actually, we've resolved both of those issues at TIBCO because we actually have some of the original minds that worked on the S language back at Bell Labs before it became S plus, the commercial version of S, and before it became R, the open source version of S or S plus, depending on who you ask. Uh, so we did, it last year, release the first and only commercial runtime for R. So this is a completely clean room creation of an execution environment for R that is 10 times faster than R. It's supported, and uh, you can come talk to TIPGO if you have a problem with it. And it's been built in such a way that it connects directly with our visual analytics engine, so you can deliver these statistics in an easy to consume visual manner, or it can be called as a web service or by any other technology that you may already have, or certainly by the TIPCO stack, as a full-fledged uh, member uh, or you know subscriber to the bus. So we've, we've done a lot of changes there, and anybody who's interested in R should definitely take a look at our enterprise runtime. Okay, and I just had one other quick question, then maybe Robin has a question. On the email alerts, I presume you can customize the, the subject lines of what come in, or is that just dynamically generated out of the system? And the reason I ask is because obviously there are going to be different kinds of issues that are raised, and it would be nice if you could just tell by looking at the email subject line what, what's going on. Absolutely. Uh, good question. So I do want to stress that the demonstration that I showed you is merely an example. Um, we, you know, the statistical process control is kind of an old technology, and I was just wanting to show that you could 
deliver something like a statistical process control system on this kind of platform in a very easy to consume kind of way that also has this kind of closed loop aspect. So that the communication emails, using our integration platform, you can literally do anything that you could imagine. So we can, of course, configure the contents of the email. Maybe it's just a quick, you know, heads up, we saw this. We can also send text messages. We can kick off BPM processes, which TIPCO is a, you know, a key provider of business process management. Um, we could really, I mean, in, in the example that I showed, we, we launched a full-blown root cause analysis environment. So your, your imagination is the limit. That example is something that's kind of easy to understand and easy to consume. It's a little harder to show in a recorded demo, uh, you know, a text message being received sure. and so on. But yes, you have complete control over the content and the, and the modality of that communication. Okay, good. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in other things in, in the sense of this is, um, seems to me, certainly a very powerful and um, impressive environment, but um, there hasn't been the mention of the word Hadoop in this, and I can understand if you're talking about streaming real-time data, Hadoop doesn't really have much of a position to play. But I'm presuming, so you can tell me if I'm correct, I'm presuming that all of this stuff in terms of R and in terms of your statistical engine and, and, and um, the integration platform can sit over Hadoop if you really wanted to, and if you had historical data in Hadoop rather than in you know databases, you could pull it out of Hadoop. Is that right? That's right, and I, I probably uh, should have put a little icon to represent Hadoop. Big, you know, the so-called big data, you know, movement is au courant, and absolutely, um, you know, we have integrations with Hadoop both on the uh, on the integration platform side, you know, so methods for connecting to feed Hadoop or to read from Hadoop, even ways for you to use MapReduce um, jobs that you've already built, you know, for Hadoop to use those against our distributed grid. So multiple places of interface and methodologies to interface uh, big data scenarios to the, to the real-time system, and as well, the visual analytics technology can connect to 30 plus different, you know, data sources, including many of the big data tools, Hadoop being among them, of course, but also the columnar uh, data sources like uh, Vertica, Netiza, Greenplum, and so on. And then the the big the big boy players, you know, like uh, Teradata and Oracle, et, et cetera, who also have big data implementations. So um, yes, absolutely, Hadoop, and uh, we've connected as well to Cassandra, and there's you know a long list of technologies that we can leverage. Okay. I mean, my other question is is really a, a connectivity question. There's an awful lot of um, what I would call legacy statistical stuff out there, and there's also new directions. I know that R is, I'd say, dominant in the minds of um, most data analysts, but there is um, <coughs> use of Python. There's um, all of the stuff, the PMML stuff that that can be generated. Um, out of SAS and SPSS, I'm, I'm presuming, but I just wanted you to say if this is the case, that you can connect that stuff in or clip executable modules into this if there's stuff lying around, because I think that's one of the things that's happening in data analysis right now is that there's a kind of movement to new technologies and new ways of doing things, but there's also a whole legacy of stuff that's years old. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's, uh, that was kind of a whole suite of questions, and I'll, I'll kind of peel the onion a little bit here. So first of all, uh, you know, from our perspective, what you might call alternative data engines, you know, for example, many of our customers have a, a legacy implementation of SAS, so they may have you know, many, many different SAS procedures that they've created for specific jobs that work very well and that they're comfortable with. So I, I didn't want to give you kind of the grand tour of all of our, of our platform in this demonstration, but in fact, we have a technology called Statistic Services, which is the go-between that, that federates access to, our, to, to various statistics engines, including our own. So if you don't want to use the TIPCO Enterprise Runtime for R, 
you can use plain vanilla R, or you can use S plus, or you can use SAS, or you can use MATLAB. So we have explicit connections to some very commonly deployed statistical, you know, his, what you might call legacy engines. I don't mean that in a derogatory manner, but you know, technologies that have been there and are, are serving your needs quite well. Um, with respect to Python, so the, the Spotfire platform has a um, very rich set of APIs, and in fact, Iron Python is our scripting language of choice within the visual analytics applications themselves. So mm -hmm. although I don't know that our statistics engine connects to uh, SciPy or, you know, some of the other common, you know, packages that are used for you know, scientific data analysis in Python, absolutely we could do that within the visual analytics, you know, engine itself. So that connection can certainly be made. And now I'm going to forget what the last piece that you asked about. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> I've probably forgotten it as well. <laughs> there is just one little detail. I'm sure the answer is yes. But um, uh, in these situations, you can certainly have a set of rules which is strong enough for you to, rather than want to visualize it or um, alert somebody to it, but just go straight into action and do something within an operational system. I'm presuming you have such an interface. I would be surprised if you didn't. Yes, I mean the uh, the business events, which is the name of our CEP product here. This engine, uh, together with this integration platform, is really you know historically that tool set was precisely for that purpose: detect patterns in data, and then take automated action in response to those patterns. And and there are competitive technologies in the marketplace who do the same. Um, what we were wanting to illustrate here is, you know, the, that kind of closed loop scenario between human based decision making and automated eventing. And, uh, but absolutely, you know, the, the, the pure automated workflows, we've got that covered as well. But we, you know, unlike most of the other vendors in the space, I'm not really aware of anyone who's doing work in this area explicitly, smoothly making that transition between human based expertise and the event engine itself to remove that kind of black box effect um, or right. at least minimize the black box effect. Um, you know, some algorithms, you know, random forests and what have you, they're just going to kind of look like a black box no matter what you do. But being able to have somebody who creates that algorithm do it in the context of the actual data to be monitored and then deploy it directly from there goes a long way to kind of smoothing the edges between those historically kind of different um, author and IT kind of personas. Okay. Well, I haven't got any more questions, so unless anybody else has questions. No, that, that was great. Well, thank you so much, folks. We've been talking to Brad Hopper, Office of the CTO at TIBCO. Very interesting demonstration, obviously. And this stuff has been around. A lot of the stuff that you guys have has been around. Of course, you're adding all the time. but. It should be noted that TIPCO is not a new company. A lot of new companies out there these days, but not you guys. So thank you so much for your time. Take care. Thank you, guys. It was my pleasure. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.